It's my pleasure to be here, and I have a couple of friends who came, which is really nice. Um, my husband, <laughs> uh, we were both on Fulbright's in Eastern Europe in 2012, so if you want to talk about American foreign policy or U.S. history or things of that sort, he taught at the uh, Moldova State University. And my friend Mercedes Sainz, and we met cute. Someday if we know each other better, we'll tell you we've been friends. We met last year when I was here. And Mary Jane Abrahams, who is, as I understand, Ms. Tiesel. She is the president of Tiesel Chile, and she is my host at the Universidad Alberto Hurtado. So it's my pleasure to be here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing at Alberto Otado, and then I'm also going to talk about a topic that's really dear to me, which has to do with open educational resources. And the issue is we know in the future it's not developing and um, developed countries, it's going to be urban developed areas and rural developed areas, and so access is a huge part of what my interests are. I was a librarian in my first life, so, so I am a researcher before I was a teacher, and this is something that, that's really important to me. So for those of you who don't know already, that's where I live. <laughs> and one of the things that's interesting is that we are quite different in the West. We, our lives are a little bit more um, heterogeneous, we are influenced very closely. I live less than two hours from Mexico, so we, ha we have tremendous interaction in the South. And then just for giggles, this is to keep me aware I need to float across the top of my topic. This is the path of the eclipse the other day. Uh -huh. And it also shows you uh, one of the reasons why, for different reasons, we have some complexities and things melding across our countries because of great distances. And it's almost exactly the same east to west for us as it is north to south for Chile. Um, this is what it looked like a few weeks before I left home. And it was the dead of summer, it was 45 degrees. For those of you over here, that's 110 to 115. <laughs> and things were not good, but I knew because I had lived in winter I'm coming here for winter, it's going to be great. And I did live in winter. And these are pictures I took in the last winter. This is my husband and one of his students. We went on a trip out to a village where he lived. I lost one of my yak tracks. And when I took this picture on the right, uh, which was at the edge of the country, a Russian soldier came out to try to confiscate my camera. So, I, you know, this has been kind of a nice change. <laughs> I'm cold, I'm sleeping in all my clothes, but it gets good soon. So what I'm doing at Universidad Alberto Tao is I'm really emphasizing English as lingua franca. And for my students who are in their sixth semester in, um, in uh, pedagogia, they understand a lot of things, and they understand the utility of English. This is why Chinese is not going to, there are many more Chinese speakers than English, but Chinese is not going to be a common language, certainly not in my lifetime. And there is this notion, which most of you know, we have all these world Englishes, you know, emanating from some kind of mothership English, and we know that isn't true, but what we know that's really important is that we have to have a place to come together. So this is easy. Mercedes and I work it out <laughs> and my Spanish and Korean, we work it out. But what do you do when it's this? So that's the challenge for the students and they're really good about that. When I introduce this concept, they <coughs> got it. Whoops, sorry, I skipped something. They got it. They got every single one of those, and some guy in the back got Beyonce. So, so all of the things that English enables for them, but bilingualism is, is at the heart of it. And so we're working with culture in terms of, I, I'm much more of a, into pragmatics in terms of English 
and so I'm trying to get them talking and doing things. I would love if you all came to class sometime. That would be really neat. Yeah, and it's a great group of students. So what I'm going to spend most of the time on, though, is the concept of open educational resources. And while last year there was a big conference on Latin America and open educational resources in Brazil, Latin America, I know Antonio mentioned, you know, Chile is slow to change. Latin America is just now beginning to get into this area. But this is not a U.S. phenomenon. The major open initiative came out of Budapest in 2002. And the Hewlett Foundation, you know, Hewlett Packard, all the stuff. The Hewlett Foundation has funded a lot of the research. So the idea, what I'd like to deal with here is what's the point, <clears throat> what's the combination? And I'll give you two or three examples of what you can do with open educational resources. So one of the things has to do with, you know, the most recognizable copyrighted concept in our country, if you do any Disney thing and you put it on this, Disney knows about it somehow. <laughs> so it's this connection between copyright and what can we do to increase access for students. So out there in the middle someplace, we like to believe there's a, a meeting point. And this isn't a new concept, of course, that it's out in the middle. So for open, there are three areas, and I'm going to deal more with um, some teaching things, but in the research component of this, you, you especially know it's not hard for you to find a great academic article. If you are away from your university, you hit a paywall. And so many of the advances in open resources have been advances in repositories and peer-reviewed open journals. So the idea is if I as a scholar work for free and you publish <laughs> my work uh, and you're making money on it but you can't get to it, that's problematic. And so these repositories are really uh, terrific accesses for you. One thing I want to mention is Academia, EDU, and ResearchGate, I don't know if you use those. Yes. Those are social media, but those are commercial, prob, uh, commercial uh, companies, and all the things that are problematic about Facebook are problematic about them. So uh, however you feel about giving up all of your information, a lot of those things, and once you get it in your own, it's kind of hard to get it out. So that's, I use them, but it's something that I caution people about. In terms of teaching and learning, the two things I want to mention, research works for students too. The students do the same thing the rest of us do. If I'm at home and I'm having trouble connecting to uh, my database, I can find something, but usually I can then access it through an open site students can do the same. In terms of teaching and learning, there's something else kind of interesting going on, and that is for teachers, I mean, you all know how much time it takes. Have you done student teaching? Have you done some of that? Um, not yet, but we have computers. But you will, and you know it takes a long time to create something. and. It, the, the time element is a thread throughout all of this. It's really important. So the thing about open is a lot of materials available to you that you then can use. And in terms of learning, of course, a lot of independent learning. We know that half the world's population, I think, is under 20, which is a bit of a challenge and because there's no way. Um, Antonio mentioned the numbers of students here who are hoping for university slots, that's a big issue, and also for people in continuing education. So these are the five R's of open. The idea is to retain it. I get it someplace, and once I have it, I use it. And I may use it entire, just as it is. I can revise it any way I want. 
I can remix it, and I really believe that remixing is really, I don't think there's anything all that original. And I do a presentation on remix culture that deals with this in broader sense than just education, but then also redistributing. So I once had this great assignment, and I thought it was really, really cool. What I did then was I went down the hall to one of my colleagues and said, oh, see how you like this. And later on, that person might say, it worked really well, but you know what? I'm going to do this with it. So that's a lot of the idea of open. So it's this combination, this movement from absolute copyright. So I don't want you to take my novel, and I don't want to steal your song or whatever. But this is the open logo on the top and the Creative Commons licensing on the bottom and that's a whole different area of discussion but essentially I can retain some of the rights and maybe you can't sell it but you could do whatever with it you can change it you could use it in your classes you can do whatever so what I'd like to do is show you some of the things that are possible Starting from kind of a big picture, and then I'll drill down to a couple of smaller things. Most of us have done something in one of these areas. I have several TED Talks I like to use in class. One of the reasons is because I can have subtitles. In Romania, I could show something by itself with English subtitles, with Romanian subtitles. It doesn't work for everything. For Spanish, it's kind of easy because there's a lot in Spanish. Well, within TED and TEDx, which is local, there's TED-ed, and then there is a TED-ed site where there are repositories of ready-made lessons. And that's kind of a cool thing. So let me show you a piece of a lesson. Over 100,000 metric tons of caffeine are consumed around the world Drink every that. year. That's equivalent to the weight of 14 Eiffel Towers. Most of this caffeine is consumed in coffee and tea, but it's also ingested in some sodas, chocolate, caffeine pills, and even beverages labeled decaf. Caffeine helps us feel alert, focused, happy, and energetic, even if we haven't had enough sleep but it can also raise our blood pressure and make us feel anxious. It's the world's most widely used drug. So how does it keep us awake? Caffeine evolved in plants where it serves a few purposes. In high doses, as it's found in the leaves and seeds of certain species, it's toxic to insects. But when they consume it in lower doses, as it's found in nectar, it can actually help them remember and revisit flowers. Like when you're studying. <laughs> in the human body, caffeine acts as a stimulant for the central nervous system. It keeps us awake by blocking one of the body's key sleep-inducing molecules, a substance called adenosine. Okay. That is one minute and 18 seconds from a six-minute lesson. And that lesson has attached to it um, some assessment questions, some discussion sessions, and assortment of other things. That's a lot easier for me to understand that my son is a our son sorry, is a biochemist and so no, caffeine is the ultimate feel good drug. So so for a student to see this, it's a, a really cool thing. And I don't have really high technical skills. It wasn't that difficult to to um, clip the video to use it here. Six minutes seems like forever if you're doing a presentation for a lesson or a lesson a student could go back to. It's really pretty cool. Another thing available from that same site, something I especially like, is another animation. Here again, free to you, um, to take, to use as you like. Actually, I can, some of these are available streaming only. And then another possibility comes out of Harvard's Project Zero, and that is a really wonderful program that has to do with developing thinking skills. So there are thinking routines 
And I'm going to do something with the students at Alberto Hurtado in just a week or so that has to do with giving them an image. What do you see? And then once you get beyond that, there's a lot you don't see because you see, but you're thinking. You know, it's happening all at the same time. What don't you see? What do you wonder? How do you extend that? So all of this is part of visible thinking, and it's adaptable at a lot of different levels. So as far as tools, there are also some aggregating sites that I recommend. And I mentioned to you that I come from um, you know, research background in terms of library research. And so some of the, the really cool things come from library areas. I, I don't you should be able to click on the timer that. here. You're but okay. You're, you're fine. I tested that yesterday, and it, it worked just if you can click on the, the link thing. I'm should sorry. Be able, yes, should be able Hold to. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Sure. Thank oh, you. Yes, here we go. We can do this. I'm so used to embedding everything. It's no worries. <clears throat> This is the... Okay, so here, let me show you. The thing about this, this comes from the University of Massachusetts, and it's fairly typical of the kind of sites that you will find where you have lots of options. So you will see here, you have reviewers. These are peer-reviewed things. Um, choices in learner-centered tools, knowledge-centered tools, which will get you into a variety of things, uh, community items, and then assessment center tools. And here's one, for example. Now, have you used, any of you used Kahoot yes. in your classrooms? Yeah. yeah, it's really cool as a classroom thing. So I let me back up here and I'll... Um, <coughs> Oh, yes. Uh, is it self-assessment? Pardon me? It's a variety of, okay. a variety of things. But these, uh, I'll show you with Kahoot the way it's going to work. OK. The thing about this, I like this a lot. My friend teaches Spanish, and she uses, uses it a lot. I know I was at a big, um, it, it had to do with um, Islamic culture, an event recently where there was a room full of people. The students log into a prepared, uh, it's like a quiz. You can use it for quizzes, for discussions, for surveys. So if, for example, you've just been through this uh, abortion uh, debate here in this country, a student might be unwilling to say, wait a minute. <laughs> but if I'm entering it on my phone, then the, the whole class can see, here's sort of how we fall apart in terms of our thinking on a topic. How have you guys used it? Um, in our Spanish class, we use it as students when we pre present a presentation and we have like vocabulary and key points mm -hmm. in the presentation. The whole, we invite the class to use it as we created the um, quiz. Right, I mean, you create the quiz mm -hmm. and you can, it's great for vocabulary. It maybe isn't as much fun as Heads Up. I don't know if you've ever, there is a game called Heads Up where you play it after dinner. Sometimes there are uh, adult beverages involved. But you're holding your phone like this and, you know, people are guessing the terms. So Kahoot is a wonderful thing because it's free, it's easy to use, it's quick. It's not going to take me all day to figure out how this product works. Another possibility, and I always recommend these to people, um, the Association of School Librarians has a great aggregating site. And also there is a company that's won several awards from Merlot. And Merlot comes out of the California universities. And essentially, you go to the site, and there are lists and access and, and links to all sorts of open education issues. So then, um, some of these are big universities, and I'm not going to pursue this a lot, but all of the big Eastern universities 
have sites where you can go in. The magic thing is OER or Open Resources. And you will find a number of possibilities and ways for you to get to things. Years ago, decades ago, when I was a student and we studied a science bibliography, we used to talk about the invisible college, like, you know, here we are, the six physicists, and I know what you're working on, and we talk this way, and then journals or the, the publication uh, vehicle. What's happened now is that many of these peer-reviewed sites have become the easy way for me to access your great thing that you're working on, and sometimes they're not complete. Sometimes there it's a pre-press or whatever, but it's it's replaced that old school model of um, scientists or academics getting together. So the thing about open that I really want to stress is the idea of access and extending access. We know education is the key. Um, for me, I'm not teaching full time anymore, so. I, I see it in a little different way. I, I came here in a teaching and uh, research proposal, so I'm spending about half of my time at Alberto Tado with students, but I'm doing some work on this too, and I'm looking at it in a bigger picture. And there is, I, I didn't have it in the presentation when I brought it to Mason, but there are a couple of really great sites that have to do with the development of open in Latin America. And um, if you want to send me an email, I would be glad to, um, to send that to you. So the, one of the Fulbright things that um, Antonio asked that, that we really try to do is to make some outreach into the community to other universities. So here are some other things that I do. And one of them I am working with, I'm going to use as a major assessment tool with students at Alberto Otado, and that has to do <coughs> with a film that has heavy cultural content. But on the surface, you probably wouldn't <coughs> notice it that much. The film is Get Out. Oh. Did you see that happen, <laughs> right? Uh, at Alberto Hurtado, they've seen Such everything in the world. They have not seen this movie, so I'm really thrilled about it. Mm -hmm. But I have, an, I have several different um, assignment type things. I have one that I have designed, but I have a friend who teaches Latin American film, and there are some other ways. Project Zero has a method for evaluating and assessing and thinking about creative works. So that's something I, I really care about. I'm all about narrative. I do some public speaking, coaching. And then in terms of presentations, I'm really interested in remix culture and some of those conceptual things and the creativity that comes from what people do. And if I only had you know, an extra 10 minutes, there is this really cool animated thing on the white stripes who had no bass player, and here's a guy who plays the bass, and he, it came together and creating entirely new products. So that's one of the things about Remix that is so interesting. But all of it, every bit of it, is a corner of digital literacy. And this is something that is huge. I taught for many years in community college, where you have the first two years of university, a lot of the students are going on, some of them are there, you know, they flunked out of the University of Arizona, whatever. And many of them, their, their first access is, oh, I will Google it and see, or I'll immediately go to Wikipedia. I do not hate Wikipedia, by the way, <laughs> uh, as some of my colleagues do. Uh, but all of it is a piece of digital literacy. And if you want to pursue that, I know a librarian in Arizona who just did this incredible thing on fake news. And he is so good. He was a history teacher at one time. He does a wonderful literacy project on fake news. So essentially, that's it. And we have two, three minutes that I would entertain any questions. Whoops. Um, you may contact me at either of those places. Any questions? 
If not, we're good. I, I did have uh, one question, uh -huh. if I may. So I noticed there was uh, four categories of the uh, tools. It was assessment-centered, community-centered, knowledge, and uh, learner-centered. Uh, is there any reason behind this categorization? No, I think what you will see, other than um, at that site, it's a university site. So they're looking for things you can use in a classroom for assessment. Okay. And other places, what they're doing is looking at, you know, how do, just like any organization, you know, how do I organize my information? It can be any way. Okay. And uh, I'm not so sure, it's not that I'm not interested in communities, it's that I've never pursued it, so I don't know that much about it. Okay. But you have the link. Yes, I do have a link. <laughs> that. I, I will share the link freely. Uh, the presentation is uh, actually online right now, so okay. people watching at home can uh, download it as well. <laughs> right. Yeah, our uh, children. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, I guess that, that was my follow-up question was, you know, you mentioned this was just one uh, repository, um, and you mentioned you had other repositories? Oh, sure. So what happens is there are peer-reviewed online journals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you teach in the sciences, you can go to, usually it's these universities that aggregate the information. You can go to the university and see, okay, here are some things. Where you might have accessed it indirectly by finding, I don't know, whatever, your uh, receptors. You're interested in mm -hmm. receptors on caffeine, you sure. might have found it that way. There are other repositories where I, as a researcher, may be working on something and I just put my document in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the peer reviewed journals are serving the function of many of the journals that, I don't know, have you ever paid for a journal article that <coughs> you're desperate? Yeah. About 27 to $30, usually. Or more, or yeah. More. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. I mean, uh, who could finish a degree if you're living in India doing that? It's just not possible. So um, one of the best and most famous of the science one comes out of, um, it's either Tajikistan or Kazakhstan. So depending on how afraid you are of accessing Russian sorts of places, this woman was working on a PhD. She started seeing all of the challenges to accessing the information she needed. And it arose almost as an informal networking site. Yeah, so there are those two ways, and they call them gold and grain. So gold, the gold are the, are the journals that have been peer-reviewed just like any published journal. The green ones, which maybe that means not quite mature yet sometimes too, but the green ones are things that individual scholars have deposited. Okay. Okay, anything else?